Hey, welcome back to another video about Subsequently. This is just a development update to talk about what's been added in the last week or so, and uh, maybe get some feedback and see what people think or what people would like to see worked on. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is a simple change. Uh, I've rearranged some of the checkboxes in some of the settings screens, and the basic idea is to group together similar uh, functions. So vertical stacks uh, have to do with the same things, and that also applies in uh, the sequencer mode setup, um, which I'll get to later. So this is a new checkbox here on the left, and it turns on uh, full velocity um, mode in the notes mode. So basically, uh, with it off like that, um, you can see that the velocity is being read and harder note or harder playing corresponds with louder volumes. With it on, uh, whether I press soft or hard, it always sends notes at full velocity, and that can just be useful um, if you don't want to have to hit the pads really hard all the time. So that's simple enough. These ones on the right existed already. They are the uh, drum layout. So this one on the bottom turns the drum layout on for this track, uh, and then this one on the top makes it multi-channel so that the notes are on different channels. And so those uh, have just been moved closer together, so they're easier to remember. Uh, now these ones in the middle are actually new. So uh, if we hit this one and go back to notes mode, you'll see up in the top left uh, are some new things. And it this is basically like a mod wheel on a uh, keyboard or a pitch bend wheel. So by default, it's mapped to pitch. So if I go and uh, play a note. I can kind of do the normal uh, pitch bendy stuff like you do with a wheel. So the way it's set up is basically just green gets you halfway through the range, and then blue gets you the full way. And you don't have to hold both of them at once, so you can either do or, and either way it gets you to the top of your range. And of course you can go negative, and as you can hear it is after touch sensitive, so the harder you press the further uh, it will go up. So the pitch bend, uh, it works okay. It's not great since the uh, aftertouch is not really high resolution enough, so it's it's useful for doing, you know, uh, a range, a bend all the way up through the range, but it's going to sound a little weird if you're trying to do kind of subtle vibrato stuff. Um, but what is useful is if you enable this second checkbox, what happens is that uh, it no longer will send pitch bend anymore, but it will basically take over the role uh, that aftertouch used to take over. So if you remember, you can enable aftertouch with this. Um, you can set up whatever you want it to send to, which I believe will be Uh, LFO. So without this checkbox on, we have an aftertouch sensitive uh, pad. Uh, that we can mess around with while we're playing. And we have the uh, pitch wheel sending pitch bins. So Um, so we can do stuff like that, but if we turn this on, then 
the aftertouch no longer gets sent uh, as a uh, control code. So no matter how hard we're pressing, it doesn't change. But now this works as uh, as the control change instead of the aftertouch. So. And you can see that uh, this still gets you a, a small way through the range, sort of fine control, and this gives you all the way through the range. Um, and the neat thing about doing this, where you're using this sort of uh, mod wheel instead of the aftertouch, is that one, it's uh, harder to accidentally press something. Sometimes when you're playing the notes, it's hard to kind of choose exactly what pressure you're playing so this way you don't accidentally press too hard or too soft and the other thing is that if you set the uh, control code offset somewhere in the middle like this um and then maybe reduce the sensitivity a little bit now you can actually do faster and slower values so you can go positive and negative um, relative to your offset you can go above and below with just this one little control and the cool thing is that you can actually record the positive values or the negative values when you're playing something in so if I turn on record arm and just uh, clear this track out and record something into it so it gives you a little bit more flexibility compared to if you had that turned off uh, and you were doing with aftertouch you can only go uh, above the control offset or um, and I don't think I mentioned this in the last video, but if you hold shift when you're selecting a sensitivity, it'll turn pink and that indicates negative. So with negative scaling on, uh, the harder you press, the smaller the value will get. So it will go below where the offset is, whereas with positive scaling, uh, it'll go above where the offset is. And then with the pitch wheel on and set to control change mode, uh, it will go above or below, depending on what you press. So I think that covers uh, everything that is different in notes mode. So now let's take a quick look at something that's new in session mode. So I'm going to go into notes mode, which I've set up with some drums, and I'm going to record something in with the click. Click to enter notes uh, feature thingy. So I'm going to hold click and just tap along. All right, so I've got that simple drum loop going, and it's going in uh, track number one. So now I'm going to hold duplicate and hit the left side which starts flashing and then hit the right side. So I've now copied this simple loop from uh, slot one in sequence one into slot two. So the same data is in both save slots. Now I have record arm on, so I'm just going to play some uh, more notes into this. Okay, so uh, we've got a little bit more going on there now. Uh, so now we've got a complex pattern in slot one, and we've got the old simple pattern in slot two that we copied earlier. So the new feature that exists is that if you hold shift plus duplicate, which is a bit of a stretch, um, but I couldn't really think of a better button to assign it to. Maybe someone has a suggestion. But uh, if you hold shift plus duplicate and you hit 
a thing, you'll see it flashes blue now instead of white. And so that actually indicates that rather than being in a uh, copy paste operation, you're in a swap operation. So shift turns the copy paste uh, duplicate button into a swap button. So I'll do that now by doing that and then hitting slot two. And you can hear we've gone back to the old simple pattern and the complex pattern rather than being overwritten has simply uh, changed places. So I can do the exact same thing. Again, shift plus duplicate. And we're back to the uh, complex pattern again. So that makes it a little bit easier to use the uh, save slot system because you don't have to be as worried about finding a free slot or overwriting something that you don't want to overwrite. So uh, that should be useful, hopefully. Now, the uh, last bit of changes that I'm going to talk about are here in sequencer mode and go into setup. So as you, as I mentioned earlier, I've moved some of these things around. So now, uh, tempo slider is still up here. Uh, swing slider is still where it was. Now these two, which I didn't mention in the last video, but uh, they are the tempo blink indicator, uh, which just blinks along with your tempo. So if we make the tempo faster with this slider, we can see this will start blinking faster or slower. And then the uh, second one is sort of the same thing, um, but it requires a track to be playing. So I'll just play one. And you can see up at the top that in addition to the uh, tempo actually blinking, we actually get a indicator of the playhead as well. So you can see that that will be synced up with whatever the uh, topmost playing track is. So if we play some other tracks uh, that are not in sync, it will always be in sync with the topmost one. So if we stop, if we stop this one from playing, it will jump to now being in sync with the orange one. And if we stop the orange one, it will actually be in sync with the yellow one. Um, and if we play the red one again, it will go back to being on the red one. So that just kind of lets you know uh, which beat the um, track is on so that if you're in a different mode, like if you're in notes mode and you're wanting to play along, you can know whether you're coming in at the first beat or the fourth beat or wherever you want to be. Um, and then the other one, as you can see, is just uh, blinking along regardless of whether there's anything playing or not. All right, so that's what those two do. So this por uh, checkbox controls what port uh, the notes and the CC and everything that gets sent out is sent on. So when it's red, it's sending over USB like it is right now. And if I switch it uh, to the other one, it uh, switches over to the DIN port. So th since there's nothing hooked up to the DIN port, you can't hear anything. Um, if I switch it back to USB, the notes come back. Uh, this next one next to it, is for sending uh, MIDI clock messages. So when you turn that on, uh, clock will actually be sent out so you can sync other stuff to your uh, subsequently uh, session going on. So if I go ahead and turn the bottom one on, that will enable the external clock. So now subsequently will listen for incoming MIDI clock signals and it will adjust its tempo uh, to that signal and tick along with that incoming signal. So I have my DAW set up to send clock right now. So if I get a sequence playing and go over to my laptop, so now I can, well, I can adjust the, uh, tempo in the DAW. And you'll see the tempo slider actually uh, update to reflect whatever tempo it's getting. And you'll see that sometimes it jumps around and it's just sort of a, 
adjusting its internal sort of uh, tempo based on what it's observing. And sometimes it seems like it's uh, not super accurate, so it jumps around. But it should always uh, tick when it actually gets a clock message, so it kind of doesn't matter what the internal values are in this mode. Um, so yeah, so with that on, clock will be received. Then this one above that uh, selects which port to listen on. So for sending clock and for sending everything else, notes and CCs and whatever, everything goes by this selection. So red for USB, green for DIN. Uh, so if I want to send clock, it will send to whichever port I have selected there. Uh, for receiving clock, you can select that separately, however. So it's the exact same color coding. So red, it will listen over USB. Green, it will listen over DIN. Um, so if I have it listening over DIN and I try to play something, nothing will play because uh, I'm not receiving clock over the DIN port. And if I switch it back to USB, it goes back to playing again. So that just gives you some flexibility. If you want to receive clock from your DAW, you can receive it over uh, the USB port. And then if you want to send out to the DIN port to control some uh, gear that just has a DIN port, you can do that separately, so independently. So you can listen on USB, send on DIN, and that'll all work just fine. And with that, I believe that those are all of the changes that I've introduced. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, leave them in the comments or uh, create a new issue on the GitHub. If you are using subsequently and trying it out, I, oh my god. Well, that was a weird drawing bug. It's like the, at least the second bug I've noticed while making this video. Well, third, except I fixed this one. I switched those two around. So, yeah, if you notice any bugs like that, I guess do the things I was just mentioning when I was talking and then saw the bug. Make an issue, leave a comment, try it out, let me know what you think. Anyway, thanks. Bye.